Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone back to our service. Got to love technology. Just when you get it on, it wants to go back off again. That's why I have a backup. So this morning we talked about the assaults on our religious freedoms, or this, about the family. This afternoon we'll be talking about assaults on our religious freedom. We think about the home and the families we talked about this morning, and not only our responsibility, but the blessings of being in a family. And we didn't go over as much of that as uh, I would like, but there are great blessings in being part of a family. There are also great blessings in being part of a free nation. We often take for granted, I believe, the things that we have here in America. I know we can complain about the problems, the way things are going, how politics plays itself out. We can complain about all those things, but we still live in probably the best nation in the world. We still have more freedoms than most nations around this world, and we need to be thankful for that. But on another note... Our freedoms are being assaulted, and they're getting worse and worse, and particularly our religious freedoms. We can talk about our political freedoms, and we should enjoy the political freedom that we have. We should talk about the social freedoms that we have. We can talk about that. But I want us to primarily talk today, and we're going to mix both back with the political and the religious, but primarily the religious freedom that we have. And it's being assaulted. And all you have to do is look on the news on a regular basis and to see what's happening. Now, regardless of various religions, our country was based upon the fact that we have the freedom of religion. We don't have to agree with other religions, and we don't. But look at what's been going on around our country recently with the Jews. Look what's been going on with them in around these colleges and the attacks on them physically just because they have a background that some don't agree with. Now I hear those who want to support the Jews saying they're God's people and we have to protect God's people. No, they were God's people under the Old Testament. They're no longer God's people. God's people are Christians today, not Jews. But they are still being physically attacked right now because you have those who half of them don't know what they're arguing for or what they're fighting for. They wear Hamas clothing or uh, some type of jihadist clothing, and then they want to fuss and fight and, and then assault others who don't agree with them. They wear their Palestinian garments right now. And half of these kids are so ignorant, they don't have a clue what they're trying to fight for. They just know that everybody else is doing it, so they want to get involved in it. And since people say the Jews are just horrible people, they must be, so they want to fight against them. So their freedoms are being definitely challenged at this time. But folks, they're not the only one. Look at what's being said on the news. I, and I know some of you, if you keep up with the news, have seen this, but the military and some of their, I call it sensitivity training, you realize they label Christians as terrorists now? Have y'all seen that? I saw part of the PowerPoint where they label Christians as domestic terrorists. Our own military. So our freedoms are being assaulted. Our nation came into existence mainly because of other nations who were seeking religious freedom to worship according to their own convictions in the new world. We had those who came from England because of the tyranny of the English government and the way they were trying to force them to be part of the Anglican church or Roman Catholicism. You've had different places that had their different state-run religions and they wanted, to be, or wanted the people to be a part of their state-run religions. There are those who came to America seeking freedom from all that 
and gain that freedom. Our first ten amendments of our Constitution as a nation are known as our Bill of Rights. And the first two amendments are as follows. Our first amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or bridging the freedom of speech or oppress or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. That's our First Amendment. That's where we get the phrase that we use, we have the freedom of speech based on that. But we also have the freedom of redress against our government. We can file grievance against our government for what they do to us if it's uh, in violation of our religious freedom that we've been guaranteed under our own Constitution. And by the way, there are those today who are saying that our Constitution is antiquated, out of date. It should be a living document, so it should be changed at any time upon the whim of some nut up in Washington. And again, folks, that's where we are today. Our Second Amendment is a well-regulated militia necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I know they want to, the liberals want to talk about that little word militia, that that's a state militia, or that's our military. No, it's not. The people have the right to take up arms, even against their own country under certain circumstances, when they're violating certain laws and our freedoms. But we need to remember also that we cannot have the First Amendment without the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment guarantees our freedom under the First Amendment. And it may be one day taking up arms. I hope that it doesn't ever come to that but we never know when it might. We have been truly blessed to have these rights and to be able to worship and submit to one true living God as New Testament Christians today. But we need to be aware. I know I've had some similar lessons, not particularly this one, but some similar ones in years past. But we're in election year. And in this election year, there are all sorts of statements being made, some true, many false. And we have to understand what's at stake with our freedom. Because there are those who would like to take us back in to the time before people fled England. To bring us back under tyranny. Under one government rule. And they make the decisions on what we do in every aspect of life. Folks, there are countries that believe that. You have these Marxist, communist countries who put their thumb on the people and they tell them what they can and can't do in almost every aspect of their lives. We don't want that here in this country. We want to be able to worship in peace. We see right now we're able to worship in peace here. Now that's not to say somebody with a gun may try to come back through those doors and try to do something. But I think here we know how to take care of ourselves, for one thing. But because we do live in a free country, it's not as likely to happen as it would maybe in some other places. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the Bible teaches us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, Thoroughly or completely furnished unto every good work. Folks, we need to be concerned about the future welfare of our nation. Already there, and for years, there have been efforts in place to limit our freedoms. And they're getting worse and worse every single year. I remember back in the early 90s when I saw some things taking place and thinking, how much worse is it going to be? Can it get much worse? And oh, it has. Far, far worse than it was in the 90s. I would 
relish to go back even to the 90s compared to what we have today. But there are infringements upon our religious freedom. They have been subtle in the past, but today they're very intrusive and they're very open with what they want to do. There are those who would like to do away with the First Amendment to keep us from having the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. The freedom to give, that gives us the opportunity to worship God in the way that we see fit. We don't have to agree with other religions in this country. We oppose other religions in this country because they don't stand upon the teaching of God's Word. Yet because of the way this country was founded, they have the right to worship. They're wrong in their worship, but they have the right to worship their God in the way they see fit. But there are those who want to eliminate that. Other efforts of redefining, and they're not subtle in this, the doctrine or the belief of marriage. I remember when we first started hearing more about same-sex marriages. And this has been going on for years, but it started becoming more popular in the 90s. Remember the don't ask, don't tell Bill Clinton policy? Let's just, we're not going to question, so if you are a homosexual, you want to be in the military, then we just don't tell us that you are, and it'll be okay. To now, not only do they have it, they push it, and they push the LBGTQ. And I like to finish with RST, UV, all the way to the end of the alphabet because they have the alphabet soup of perverted, deranged issues that people have that they want to call same-sex this or all sorts of things nowadays. You have people wanting to marry the same sex, animals, and anything else they can think of even inanimate objects. That's how deranged people are. And it's all mental issues. And we can look at it in however way this country wants to look at it. I say we, I'm talking about the country. But as Christians, we know these people who do these things, they have mental problems. You look at the suicide rate among homosexuals and lesbians. It's extremely high. It's a lot higher than heterosexuals. Because of their belief system, it drives them into that sort of situation where they feel like they can't live here anymore. Because of their perversion, it creates more and more mental problems with them. And they don't know how to cope. I have seen homosexuals come out of that lifestyle and change and get the help they need and do better. A lot of them don't. But they're pushing the same-sex marriage on us to the point that if we disagree, and as a matter of fact, if they wanted to say something about this sermon, could try to cause us problems just for even talking about it. Because that makes us quote their use as us being homophobic. No, that's us following God's word. And the Bible is clear over and over and over again from the Old to the New Testament that homosexuality is a sin and will cost a person their soul in hell. And we want to try to teach others out of that kind of lifestyle so they don't lose their soul in the devil's hell. Let's look at Romans chapter 1 verses 25 through 27. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of a woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving do themselves that recompense of the error, error which was meat. The very moral fiber of our nation is being shredded. Morality to a lot of people in this country means absolutely nothing anymore. 
Then next, there are things that should cause us to fear the future of our nation. I mean, it's already there, but how much worse is it going to get to us physically? Because you have people that are physically attacking those that they don't agree with, whereas politics and or religion. And you can tell the wrong person that you're a Christian and they may attack you simply for telling them that you're a Christian. We're going to continue to face increasingly hostile culture in this country. There's already a large segment of society that if they had their way, they'd just kill us all anyway and wouldn't think anything about it. If there's not any kind of restraint, then there's going to be anarchy. And unless we can get our country back under control, then there's going to be anarchy. And the way that we can do it as Christians is not to go out and fight with people. It is to fight, but not physically. But do so at the polls. To get people into office who share the beliefs of a more conservative value to keep us free and to keep us safe and healthy while we live here in this country. In Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive unto themselves damnation. We don't resist the ordinance of God. What is the ordinance of God? Civil government. God is the one who put civil government into place. And we have it, good or bad. There are countries, again, around this world that their civil government is horrible. It's because man has perverted the government that God gave us. God gave us civil government to have laws. We have to have laws. They have to be obeyed. But there are those who are enacting laws that hurt those who want to do what is right. So where can we make our difference? At the polls. And if you haven't been voting, I want to encourage you to vote. Vote what you think is right, but vote what is moral and what is good. And unfortunately, folks, majority of the time when we vote, it's going to be the lesser of two evils. Because many times, neither one are great, and a lot of times they're not even good. But one, typically we can find, is better than the other. So we need to think about that when we go to the polls, because not going is going to assure eventually that we're going to be under some type of regime or some type of government that is not going to be conducive to Christianity. I can see in the future, not that I'm a prophet or the son of prophet, but I can see if this country goes the way it has been over the last 20 years, that these doors won't be open one day, nor any church unless it is a state-governed religion where they try to force us or force anyone in the country to worship according to what they want. What will we have to do then? We're going to keep on worshiping God the way we know that we should worship Him in spirit and in truth. It may not mean we can meet in a, meet in a building like this publicly and openly. It may be as, say, underground, but we'll still worship. True Christians are going to remain true and faithful Christians. And it could get to the point, like in the first century, you look at how many of the apostles died. They were persecuted and put to death because they stood up for Christ. It may come to a point that we may be put to death for being Christians. So be it. We'll just go home to be with God. The Bible tells us in Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. That didn't say until death, not until you die, but unto the point of death, which means someone may put you to death because you're a Christian. 
We never renounce Christianity, nor Jesus Christ, nor God's Word. And by standing firm on it, it may cost us our life one day. We need to be prepared for that. But let's do what we can now to keep it from getting to that point, if possible. Next, religious people already are and will continue to face an increasingly hostile legal system. With non-discrimination laws already in place, they're trying to make private citizens and organizations business, civic associations, and religious institutions liable in civil suits for refusing to accept the LGBTQ plus whatever else they want to say lifestyle. And not just that, any other lifestyle or any other belief or doctrine that they may have. It's going to become more and more hostile to Christianity. Remember what happened to Hobby Lobby several years ago where Hobby Lobby has a lot of stores throughout the United States and they were told they were going to be fined a million dollars a day if they didn't abide by court ruling to accept LGBTQ. They fought it and ultimately won but what if they hadn't? They would have just shut their doors before they gave into that, and they had already said that. Now, there was a victory there, which set a legal precedent. But you get some liberal judge in that doesn't care about legal precedent, they'll do what they want to do. You're seeing that now. You're seeing that openly in some court systems. And it's just going to get worse. Next, what are we as Christians going to do under these circumstances? Keep in mind that the United States and its first ten amendments known as the Bill of Rights still is the basic law of the land. And as citizens, we have a right that's guaranteed to us, including freedom of speech, whether the other side likes it or not, including the freedom to worship the way we know what the Bible teaches, yet it's going to become more hostile to us regardless. We're not a political organization. We don't fight with politics. We simply obey the gospel and continue to live a faithful Christian life, but we exercise our rights as citizens of this country to go out and vote as we should. Because, again, if we don't, we know what's going to happen. In Acts chapter 25, there were Jews who made false accusations against Paul in the temple. And Paul met Festus. And it says, but Festus in Acts 25, 9 through 12, willing to do to the Jews a pleasure, and answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things where thou these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal to Caesar. Paul was a Jew... But Paul was a Roman citizen as well. And he had the right to appeal to Caesar. And they said, you want to go to Jerusalem and be tried with the Jews? He said, I appeal to Caesar. He was invoking his rights as a Roman citizen to go before the highest person in the land to have his case tried before Caesar himself. Not before a kangaroo court among the Jews who would have found him guilty because they wanted nothing more than to kill Paul. And Festus, in verse 12, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed to Caesar? Unto Caesar thou shalt go. 
he knew that if he turned them over to the Jews, that he was violating Paul's civil and technically constitutional rights as a Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar. And he says, Unto Caesar thou shalt go. Folks, we have rights in this country, and we need to exercise our rights because our civil rights and our political rights will never trump our religious rights, but they go hand in hand. If we leave our civil rights at, alone and we don't go out and vote and we don't stand up for ourselves, <clears throat> then we're going to lose our religious freedom as well. We see in nature God is instilled within animals <clears throat> to defend themselves and even their young. We hear the old phrase, don't mess with mama bear. A lot of times talking about the mamas in the family. Where do you think that phrase came from? You try to get between a mama bear and her cubs and see what happens. That mama bear will tear you to shreds because she's going to protect her cubs. And that phrase is often used because a mama is going to protect her children. You better leave her children alone. Well, folks... We have the right to protect ourselves. And as citizens of this country, we need to use our rights to protect ourselves. In 1 Timothy 5, 8, it says, But if any will not provide for his own, especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Providing for his own means the husband of the family has the greatest responsibility to take care of his family and protect his family, to provide for his family, and to nurture his family. But I mentioned the first one, protection. Husband's got a big responsibility. Men, would you allow someone to come into your house and kill your family and you stand idly by, or would you be willing to take a bullet and die for your family to protect them. <clears throat> Hopefully, and I think most here, if not all here, would stand up and fight for their family because that's what God intends for us to do. We're to take care of our family, provide for our family, protect our family. I thought it was interesting. I, I had to go by. I was trying to serve some legal paperwork at a residence and spoke to the lady of the house, the it, it was her nephew that was there and was trying to serve him some paperwork. She said he wasn't there. We got to talking, and she was talking about she's got her own pistol. She says, my husband's more passive. He's non-confrontational. She said, I'll confront somebody in a minute. I don't have a problem with it. And he doesn't like guns and doesn't know much about guns. So she said, I told him, you leave my gun alone. If somebody breaks in, I'll take care of business. Well, at least somebody is, but really it's the husband's responsibility to take care of the wife, not the other way around. But in some situations, I guess it happens around here. But this is what we've been told. If any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he's denied the faith of God. And it's worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever. Jesus even emphasized in the Bible, folks, that we've got a right to bear arms. You realize that? I went out to California and preached a meeting several years ago, and there was a gentleman there that wasn't a member, but he attended there some. And it came up about me being law enforcement. And he was sitting next to me while we were eating the, the potluck meal on Sunday afternoon. And he said, how, as a Christian, can you carry a gun? Of course, this was a liberal California person that doesn't believe in them. And there was one of the members sitting across from me. I turned to say something. He said, let me, John. Let me just say vo his voice was raised, not the other dude, but he led into that guy and told him what he thought about him and his views and how the Bible does teach that. So I came home and I did a study on it. And I found some material put some material together, and sent it back for him. But here's a verse that should help us with this. Luke twenty-two thirty-six. 36. 
Then he said unto them, But now he, hath, he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. What was Jesus telling his apostles? Guys, if you don't have a sword, you might need one. You think that's Jesus authorizing us to protect ourselves? Absolutely. Now that doesn't mean we go out and buy a gun and we go looking for trouble. Let me see who I can go shoot. No, that's not what we do. That's for protection, not for assaulting someone else. And if we go out looking for trouble, and I've known some, matter of fact, I've known some Christians who went out looking for trouble when they shouldn't have been and got themselves into trouble. But if trouble comes looking for you, you've got a right to protect yourself. And we're living in a country now where we need to be able to use everything that is at our feet to protect ourselves. We have a lot of avenues, a lot of resources that the Bible authorizes us to do and allows us to do. The Bible says that it's a sin to murder someone, but it's not a sin to protect yourself. And if that person dies in the process of us protecting ourselves or our families, and that's not murder, folks. Murder is intentionally, willfully wanting to go out and kill someone for whatever reason there is. But if someone seeks to kill you and you protect yourself, it's self-defense. And one thing I love about Texas, Alabama was the same way, is there's a lot of protection for people who do protect themselves under the law. I'll leave it at that. Again, we're not to use those things for personal insults. Now, nowadays, I don't know why. you got young people that they'll go out and get them a gun, and you get in an argument with somebody, they just want to go out and start shooting. They don't do that, folks. You've got to be responsible. I haven't taught a class here in a good long while. I need to do one of my safety classes again. It's been a while. But to go over some things and to show... Our responsibility, because it is a great responsibility, and if you're not willing to take it, then don't get anything to protect yourself. But there is a great responsibility there. But our armor and weapon as Christians is defending the Christian faith through the inspired Word of God. We don't have time to read it, but Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, we put on the armor of God, and we fight a spiritual warfare with spiritual weapons. That's the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. As I close... We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray that God will allow us to have the freedoms that we have had in the past. And even those freedoms that have been taken away, let's pray that we can get some of those back. Let's pray that we can put people into positions of authority that will grant us those freedoms once again. And that we can enjoy living in this country, not just for us, but folks, we've got generations coming up that we need to protect as well. Children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren. We want to leave this place safe for them as well. And we need to teach them what their responsibilities are to the government and as citizens, but most of all to Christ as a citizen of the kingdom. Let's continue to pray that people will wake up before all these freedoms are taken from us and that as Christians, we will fight for our freedoms and do so with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, that one day we can in enjoy heaven as our home. As a child of God, if you're not living as you should, why not come back and ask God to forgive you? Change your life in repentance, confession, and we'll pray for you. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, then you need to do so to become a Christian so that your sins can be washed away and heaven can be your home as you live a faithful life. If there are those who are subject in any way to the Lord's invitation, come right now. Why together stand while we sing?